so now we've been recorded so uh, hi everybody so i mean before we start just one quick announcement um so we posted the homework one on the website it's due in two weeks so just take a look um and again just reminding you you can solve it individually or in pairs and then submission is going to be sorry on grade scope and we're going to post you know the, the code one so when we have it or maybe we already have it i'm not sure but yeah, it's going to be on grade scope <clears throat> I'll, I'll post the code on piazza soon <laughs> Yeah, Max, take it away. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Um, there we go. I was having some trouble screen sharing. <laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, let's looks like not everyone's here yet, but let's go ahead and get started. I'm again gonna start with some review of last time. So hopefully uh we won't miss too much. Uh okay, so last lecture, last time, we were kind of midway through proving. Cheers and equality. And what did this say? Cheers and equality said kind of we were just proving it for deregular graphs. So we said for any deregular graph, GVE, basically that you can approximate the Cheeger constant or edge expansion of the graph by the spectral gap. Uh, so a little bit more formally, the statement was that. H of G, the Cheeger constant, is sandwiched in between one minus lambda two over two uh, and the square root of two times the spectral gap. Uh, and the idea here is kind of the, the edge expansion is a useful but maybe hard to compute quantity, whereas the spectral gap is, is easy to compute. And, and so it's, it's nice that we can approximate H of G uh, with something that we can compute efficiently. Uh, efficiently. Um, Okay, so we were kind of midway through the proof. So I want to kind of review up to the point of where we, where we were, what we were doing, what was the proof idea. Um, I guess I should say we were kind of, we'd finished, the, we'd finished this part, right? This was kind of through uh, some similar arguments to expand our mixing um, with maybe some additional subtleties. And, and we, were, we were partway through the upper bound. Um, so we're going to finish the upper bound today. Um, so how were we proving the upper bound? Well, we were actually doing it by exhibiting an, an algorithm. We were doing it constructively. Um, and I introduced something called Fiedler's algorithm, which was the process that we were using. And the idea was that Fiedler's algorithm would input a function on vertices and it would output a set S, or you can think of it as a cut equivalently. And the idea would be kind of that if F has small Rayleigh quotient, we want the output, we want to claim that the output uh, set is sparse. Sorry, that the, that the cut that's output is sparse, that the set that's output has good expansion. Um, sorry, has, has poor expansion, and that it outputs a sparse cut. Um, so what was Fiedler's algorithm? Well, there were three steps. Um, the first was basically bookkeeping. We were just going to sort all of the vertices uh, in terms of, of F. Uh, sorry, one second. Uh, okay, we were just going to sort all of the vertices. So we just said one, sort vertices in, in increasing order. And then second, we're basically going to consider uh, kind of the cuts along this order. Um, so, and, and I guess I should, I should note, I'm, I'm going to give a, a slightly different, uh, version of this today that matches the notes a little bit better and will be a little bit easier to work with in, in the rest of the proof. Um, but it's uh, the same idea for all I one through N, we're going to compute the, the expansion, uh, of this cut SI, uh, which I'll, I'll define in just a second. Um, so we're going to compute kind of the maximum of HSI and HSI bar. So we wanna make sure that we're comparing to the smaller of, of SI and the rest of the graph without SI, where what is SI? This is just defined to be VI through VN. So last time I think I defined this to be V1 through VI and I'm now flipping this to match the notes uh, just to make sure everything's the, the same. 
So Max, I don't know if it's just me, but it's not showing anything here on the screen. So it's taking its time. Oh, that's it's not good. Great. You haven't seen what you're writing. Yeah. Now, okay. now it's, so I don't know if it's just on my end or if, or if it's something on yours. Can others have this? It, it's happening to me too. There's just a large delay. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, somehow you're I mean, writing I mean, and like a minute later it shows up. If I if I draw like a box, do you see this now? Yeah. Huh. Okay. Well, sorry. Um <laughs> I think it maybe was because I was just trying to display the notes at the same time. So I guess I'll just do it with no notes. Um, okay. So now, now it's in real time. If I, if yeah. I scribble, yeah, yeah. Okay. It looks like I can't simultaneously do the notes and give a lecture. So. Uh, all right. That's fine. Um, okay. So I guess let me. If people weren't seeing what I was saying, let me quickly <coughs> review what I wrote. Um, we're proving Shiger's inequality. It's written out here. H of G is bounded above and below by some function of the spectral gap. It's we have here that is now hopefully on your screen. Uh, and, and we do this through Fiedler's algorithm, which I'm part way through writing. And the first step of Fiedler's algorithm is that we, uh, we want to sort the vertices in terms of, of F. The second step is that uh, we're going to look at uh, what are called sweep cuts. Basically, we're just going along the sorted vertices and looking at kind of every way to, to split them as we go along. And we're computing uh, the, the expansion of each of these cuts. Um, I guess let me note, maybe just for clarity, because I'm not sure we've actually written kind of this form, this maximum form here. Uh, but th this is just equal to E of SI, SI bar divided by D times Basically, we're just making sure that we're comparing to the smaller of the two sets. Like we're, we're kind of saying it's okay if SI is bigger than V over two, because if that's the case, we're gonna take, we're just gonna take its complement. We're gonna com always compare to the smaller of the two. So then we're dividing by the minimum of SI or SI bar. So this kind of gets around the needing to use V over two sets of size less than or equal to V over two. You just always make sure you're comparing to the thing that is less than, you always compare to the smaller set. Um, it's really just kind of notational, but it's a little bit easier to, to write this way. Uh, and step three is we're just going to output the sparsest cut, right? We're trying to input a function with low Rayleigh quotient and output a sparse cut. So we're computing all of these and let's just, we'll output SI that minimizes this, this quantity, that minimizes the expansion slash the uh, sparsity, it maximizes the sparsity of the cut. Uh, okay, just to double check, uh, people can now see the what's being written. Okay, cool. Sorry about that. It's I don't know why it worked last time, but it didn't work this time. It's a mystery. Um, okay, so so how are we proving Fiedler's algorithm? Well, I, I claimed that we were kind of going to do it in two steps, and we were almost through proving step one last time. But let me outline the the two steps again. So the first step is to prove what I was calling kind of a simplified. Uh, oh, sorry, actually, first I want to say, uh, I should state kind of what we want to prove. Right, so I've said that our goal is if F has small Rayleigh quotient, we'd like to, we'd like to show that the cut that's output uh, is, is sparse. So let me, let me write this more, more formally. Uh, I think I was calling this Fiedler's guarantee. Uh, and this just said that, you know, given Given a function f that's orthogonal to the constant function, to the constant vector, uh, Fiedler does indeed kind of output a cut that's that's bounded, whose expansion is bounded by the Rayleigh quotient. Uh, so Fiedler outputs Si satisfying um, again, we're just going to compare to either Si or Si complement, whichever one's smaller. Um, which is equivalently, we can write like this. The maximum of HSI or HSI bar uh, is upper bounded by uh, the square root of two times the Rayleigh quotient of the input function F with the Laplacian. Uh, and, and I guess I'll, I'll note, right, this is actually, this is stronger. This is strictly stronger than the upper bound of Cheeger's inequality. Why? This implies Cheeger just by plugging in 
f being the eigenvector associated to lambda 2, or equivalently to mu 2, which recalls this is the second smallest eigenvector of the Laplacian uh, and is equivalent to the spectral gap. So I should say maybe equals 1 minus lambda 2. Um, so Fiedler's guarantee, if we can prove it, is kind of like a constructive, stronger version of the upper bound for Cheekers inequality. Um, so we were we were going to prove this guarantee through through two steps. Um, so step one was to prove a simplified version, right? So this was kind of simplified. And this had to do with showing that if not if your function is uh, orthogonal to one, but if your function is non-negative, then you're kind of in good shape. And particularly, I, th I think the statement I said last time was was kind of given uh, given non-negative f, we output s such that h of s is less than or equal to to Rayleigh quotient of f with l. Uh, and I actually want to to add something. I, I'm going to. It's a, it's exactly the same proof uh, as what we were doing last time. This isn't going to require any changes, but I want to add uh, actually a slight strengthening of this. We're going to get something slightly stronger than this, which is in particular uh, kind of moreover. S can be written as S T which maybe you'll remember this is the set. These are the sets that we were talking about during the proof last time. This is just all V such that F of V is greater than or equal to T. So it can be written as ST for some T strictly greater than zero. Uh, and and the, the proof of this is going to be exactly the same as what we were doing last time. Uh, but actually this fact that T is greater than zero uh, is important. And, and the reason that's, that it's important is that uh, notice that for the for the full guarantee, we're bounding this maximum of SI and SI bar, right? So we have, we're always looking at the smaller one, but in the simpler version, I'm not bounding the maximum. I'm, I'm only looking at, at the set S itself. And the fact that uh, this set can be expressed for T greater than zero is basically going to allow us in our reduction to, to move between the maximum and just H of S by guaranteeing that S is, has, uh, has size less than or equal to v over two. I'll, I'll explain in more detail when we get to the point what I mean by this, but I just wanted to highlight that this is a, a slight strengthening of what I said last time, and it's going to help us with the with the reduction. Uh, speaking of which, so let me just overview. The second part is is kind of the reduction, where we want to uh, you know we're we're given we're given f orthogonal to one. We kind of want to reduce to uh, some kind of associated non-negative g, function g related to f in some nice way, uh, that will let us just apply step one to, to prove the result. Um, so g will have a couple of nice properties, like its support will be at most uh, v over 2. And this will help us, uh, you know, this will kind of combine with this to, to make sure that the set is sufficiently small. Uh, it'll be non-negative, uh, and it will kind of play well with Fiedler's algorithm in a way that I will uh, describe in detail when we actually get there. Um, okay, so now now I want to pause because this is this is kind of the outline of the proof and what what we're proving. I'll go. I'll give another reminder of kind of how far we got into the proof right after this, but I want to pause for questions on the setup because I have slightly changed a few things here, so I want to make sure there's no uh, no confusion because of this. So any any questions on the setup? Okay, cool. If not, feel free to stop me going through the proof if you have questions. I mean, always. Um, but let's let's go ahead and get back into the proof then. So last time, last time we were kind of part way through step one. Uh, and so let me remind you, kind of what we were doing. The the key idea, or one of the key ideas was to use the probabilistic method. 
Uh, and in particular, we showed kind of, we were using some kind of expected form of the probabilistic method, where really what we wanted to show, um, we proved that it was enough to show the following, the kind of this expected version of expansion of H, H of S, um, where we take the expectation of the numerator and denominator. And I'll, I'll remind what ST is in a second and what the distribution this is over. We want to prove that this is less than or equal to um, square root of two times the Rayleigh quotient of the input function f with l. Uh, and okay, so what is this distribution over? Well, the kind of the key thing in the probabilistic method is is selecting an appropriate distribution, right? This is often half the battle. So what is this distribution uh, over kind of sets st? So what? is our distribution over cuts. Well, this was kind of done in two steps. Let me remind you how we define this distribution. The first thing we did is that we pulled t from 0, 1 in a way such that t squared was uniformly distributed. t is not uniformly distributed, but t squared is, is uniform on 0, 1. And we already saw a little bit how this is helpful to kind of move to, right? We analyzed the denominator and we got that this was equal to F transpose F basically because we got to move things to squares. Uh, kind of probabilities ended up being squares and this kind of let us massage something that is uh, starting to look like the Rayleigh quotient. So we're, we've already started to see why this is useful. Um, and step two, I, I should say, we, we output the cut ST which is the same as what I defined before and kind of the strengthened version of the, of the simplified Fiedler, which is just all V such that F of V is greater than or equal to T. Uh, okay, so this was our distribution. And what did we prove last time? Well, last time I believe we had, uh, we had shown the analysis of the denominator and that's kind of where we stopped. We had shown that the expectation over this distribution of D size of ST uh, was was actually exactly equal to d f transpose f. So this is kind of where we stopped last time. Uh, and and this time, so what do we have to do this time? Well, we have to analyze the numerator and and prove the prove the the full bound based on that. Uh, and then we'll show how to reduce to this simplified version. We'll show the step two, which is the reduction. Um, okay, I guess I'll I'll. Pause one more time for questions, and this is this is the end of the review from last lecture, and we'll we'll move into to uh, finishing a proof. Okay, cool. Let's go ahead and move on. So so now we want to analyze the numerator. So we want to analyze the number of edge, the expected number of edges cutting between uh, the set ST and, and its, uh, its complement under this distribution. Uh, and I'm not gonna go through uh, you know, exactly all the gory details uh, as I did for the, for the denominator, because the, at the start, we're gonna use exactly the same trick. We're gonna use this trick where we kind of express, we express E ST, uh, ST bar, as a sum of indicators over edges for whether each edge was cut, right? So the, the number of cut edges as a random variable can be written as the sum over an uh, indicator for each edge of whether that edge was cut. And the bilinear, bilinearity of expectation, we can take the sum over those expectations. And what does this end up getting us? So if you just write this out, we'll have the kind of for, for every edge BW in E, what is the expectation of the indicator? Well, it's just the probability that VW is cut by ST. So this is just using, again, the same trick we did last time. We express things out as indicators and use linearity of expectation, and we get to this sum. Um, OK, so what is this probability? Let's uh, draw this little diagram we had similar to last time. So we have FV and FW. Let's just assume for now that FW is larger than FV. We can order them however we want. Um, so when are these two things cut, kind of by definition of ST? Well, they're cut exactly when t lies in between them, right? So when t lies in between them, then fv is, is in st, sorry, fw is in st and fv is not, so they're cut. 
Uh, but if T lies on one side or the other, then they're both in ST or they're both not in ST. And so they're not cut. So it's, it's cut exactly when T lies in between FW and FV, right? Okay, so this is equal to this sum of the probability that T is uh, sandwiched between FV and FW. Um, oh, sorry, I just lost. There we go, had an iPad error. Uh, okay, so we can now use the same trick as last time where remember we moved to kind of the square. So we wanna we want talk in terms of the square because we know the square is uniformly distributed. And because our function is, is non-negative, right? This probability is exactly the same as the probability that T squared is sandwiched between FV squared and FW squared. Right, so because everything's not negative, we can always just square everything, square everything, and, and nothing changes. It's the same event. Um, but t squared is uniformly distributed between uh, on on zero one. So what's the probability it lies between f of w squared and f of v squared? Well, it's just their it's just their difference, right? It's f of w squared minus f of v squared. So this is equal to the sum. I'm leaving out VW here, but uh, it should be clear from context of F of F of W. Oh, sorry, no probability. This is equal to F of W squared minus F of V squared. And let's just put absolute value signs. So we don't have to assume one is bigger than the other at this point. Um, okay, that's great. So, uh, let's actually, let's expand this out. Um, sorry, the squared was in the wrong place there. Um, so I guess I want to maybe note at this point that our, so our goal is to kind of get this to look like the quadratic form given by the Laplacian, right? Of F transpose, we kind of want, we want things to look like F transpose LF, because this is the numerator of our, of our Rayleigh quotient. Uh, and, and kind of, how are we going to get here? Well, if we write this out, if we write this out, uh, we can write it as a sum over edges. So this is just expanding the definition of the, of the Laplacian as one minus the adjacency matrix. We can write this out uh, as kind of the sum over maybe VW of F of V minus F of W squared over, over the degree D. Uh, this is just writing it out by definition. If you don't believe me after class, just, uh, just take a look at it and write it out. It's, it's direct from the definition. And so you can, you can look at this sum we have here and you can see it's, it's starting to look similar. Kind of the problem is that the square is on the inside and we kind of want the square to be on the outside. And the rest of this proof is just basically going to be kind of massaging things with Cauchy-Schwartz to move the square to the outside to get the term that we want. Um, so let's just go ahead and do that. So first, let's uh, let's expand this. So this is equal to f of the uh, f of w minus f of v times f of w plus f of v, right? Um, and now we use Cauchy-Schwartz. Uh, so in particular, we have these two terms. It's like an inner product between these two terms. And so we can use Cauchy-Schwartz. Uh, and what do we get? Well, uh, we'll get on the left, we'll get the sum of f of w minus f of v squared. So that's really starting to look like the Laplacian, right? So we're, we're kind of in business on this term. Uh, and on the right-hand side, we're going to get this term that's that's maybe less a little less clear what to do with. Uh, f of w plus f of v squared, again, the one half. Uh, and kind of, if there's one thing you learn in, in, in this course, it's be if you, if you see some term you don't know what to do with, try to apply Cauchy-Schwartz to it. So let's try to apply Cauchy-Schwartz again. Uh, and in particular, we'll use the form uh, a plus b squared is less than or equal to 2a squared plus 2b squared. This is provable by Cauchy-Schwartz. So we'll, we'll leave the left term as is, because this is looking like the Rayleigh quotient. Uh, the right term, let's let's apply this Cauchy-Schwartz inequality and see what we get. We now get two, the sum over edges uh, of f of w squared plus f of v squared. Uh, but now we can we can simplify this, right? Because we're kind of w and v no longer have any correlation. Um, so basically what we're doing is we're just summing over vertices, uh, summing over kind of f v squared of vertices. And you can ask, how many times are we hitting uh, f of v squared for each vertex v? We're summing over all edges. The graph is d regular, which means that each vertex is hit exactly d times. Right? So we can rewrite this sum over edges as a sum over vertices. 
right? So this is this is equal to again. This just stays the same. This becomes we pull out a d factor from hitting the, each vertex d times. This is now a sum over vertices of f of v squared. Uh, but this is exactly f transpose f, right? By definition, this is sorry. These should both have uh, square roots. This is two d f transpose f. So one half, and let me maybe just rewrite this. So this is what we end up with. Uh, we end up that the numerator is bounded by this kind of term on the left that looks like uh, the, the numerator of the Rayleigh quotient. And the term on the right is looking more like the denominator of the Rayleigh quotient. But we're going to see that it's going to cancel uh, some with the denominator that we analyzed earlier. So let's go ahead and put them together uh, and just to see that we get the right bound. So OK, we wanted to analyze the expectation of EST ST bar divided by expectation of d st and just plugging in plugging in what we just proved and what we proved last class All right this is less than or equal to okay well let's just draw a giant giant square root so we have this left hand term fw minus f of v squared uh, and then kind of combining this right hand term with the denominator that we analyzed before what do we get? Well, we get a, a two out in front. And then inside the square root, we get d f transpose f. And remember, I, I, I told you that the form of the Laplacian is exactly this, or the, the quadratic form given by the Laplacian. So th this is, if you work it out, exactly f transpose lf. All right, so this is equal to the square root of two f transpose lf over f transpose f, but that's the definition of the Rayleigh quotient, right? This is the square root of 2 times the Rayleigh quotient of fl, uh, which is what we were trying to prove in the first place, right? So then kind of by the probabilistic method arguments we talked about last class, uh, this does indeed imply there exists. So this implies kind of there exists some st uh, such that h of st is less than or equal to square root of two uh, Rayleigh quotient of FL. And let me just note that because of, so I added this kind of strengthened version at the beginning, right? Where I've where I said uh, the, the set should actually have this form ST for T greater than zero. And the reason that this proof still, that this exact proof still works for that stronger statement is that in the distribution that we picked uh, up here, the probability of picking T equals zero. So the only problem is if we were to pick T equals zero. But because t squared is uniformly distributed on 0, 1, that happens with probability 0. So essentially, we don't have to worry about this case. The probabilistic method will still imply that there must be some st for t greater than 0, such that this bound still holds, which gives the stronger version of the simplified result. Uh, OK, I'll, I'll, that's, that's the end of the proof of, of step 1. I'll, I'll pause again for questions before moving to the reduction to actually finish the proof of Fiedler's guarantee and the Tigger inequality. Okay, um, let's, uh, let's go ahead and move on to the reduction then. So let's take a look at step two, just kind of reduction from f orthogonal to one to related non-negative, some related non-negative function g. Uh, and, and this is basically just going to be kind of one key lemma. Um, so let's uh, let's let's state it. Uh, so for all functions orthogonal to one, I claim that there exists a function g satisfying four properties uh, that are going to be really useful to us. So one, this is this is kind of uh, this is the g that's here. One is that g is non-negative. So this is crucial so that we can apply the, the what we just proved, right? The simplified version for non-negative functions. So G is non-negative. The second is that the support of G has size at most V over two. And I kind of hinted about this uh, at the beginning in the setup, right? 
This is important because the simplified version only analyzes H of S instead of analyzing maximum of H of S, H S bar. So to, to deal with this, we have to make sure that the, that the S set that we're analyzing uh, is of size less than or equal to V over two. Uh, and the support condition I'm going to show you can guarantee that. Um, although that shouldn't necessarily be obvious. Maybe let's just add support, what, what, what support of G is. Ah, yeah, that's probably helpful. This was the support of G is the number of non-zero coordinates of G. So the number of positive uh, coordinates in this case, because G is not negative. So I guess let me write that. Number of positive, I guess I should say non-zero. Number of non-zero coordinates or values. Right, so we want at most, we want at most V over two, uh, size of V over two of the, of the values of G, of the coordinates of G to be uh, positive, to be non-zero. Um, the third condition is something about the Rayleigh quotient. So this shouldn't be surprising. We want that the Rayleigh quotient of G is upper bounded by the Rayleigh quotient of F. Uh, and, and finally, this is kind of what I said, it, it needs to play well with Fiedler's algorithm. So what do I mean by this? What I mean is that every, Every cut considered by Fiedler on G should also be considered by Fiedler on F. And I'll explain in just a second why this is, or why we want this rather. So basically the, the idea here is that we want to reduce to G in the sense that we can just run more or less run the kind of simplified version on, on G and be guaranteed that when we actually run Fiedler's algorithm on F, it will output something as least as good as it did when it, when it ran on G. And so by, by guaranteeing that kind of every cut considered on G is also considered on F, if we just run Fiedler's algorithm on F, which outputs the best possible option, clearly it will output the best possible option on G as well, because it's considering everything that is considered on G. Um, so this, this last property just lets us run things on F, uh, but still kind of get all the guarantees that we would get from this nice non-negative function with, with nice properties uh, that we can apply the simplified theorem to. So I guess, let me just quickly prove kind of, if we can prove this lemma, why are we done? So let me, let me just prove that quickly and then I'll, and then I'll prove the lemma for you. And, and that'll actually be the, the end of this uh, proof. So kind of, let's first do, why does this imply Fiedler's guarantee? Um, okay, so we're we're given we're given f. Let g be the function promised by the lemma. Uh, what do we know? We we know that if we uh, we know that if there we know there exists a set S T with t greater than zero. This is by the stronger variant uh, of the of the simplified version, such that. Uh, so that S of T is considered by Fiedler's algorithm on G and H of ST uh, is less than or equal to the square root of two times the Rayleigh quotient of GL, which is less than or equal to the square root of two times the Rayleigh quotient of uh, FL. And, and notably, we know that because, because the support of G is at most V over two, remember how ST is defined, right? ST is defined to be all the vertices who have value greater than T. And T is picked to be strictly greater than zero, but at most V over two values of G have value greater than zero, right? So this implies that the size of ST is less than or equal to V over two. Um, and I guess maybe, so maybe writing this more explicitly, uh, this implies that H of ST is actually equal to the maximum of h of st comma h of st bar, which is how we were writing it earlier. Remember, this is really just saying that we're always comparing to the smaller set and that I'm forcing st to be the smaller set. Uh, so altogether, what does this mean? Well, this means that this, this cut with st uh, satisfies the desired bound uh, and is considered by, you know, finally, st is considered by, by guarantee four up here it's considered by Fiedler on F. 
And because Fiedler outputs the best possible, you know, the minimum of all possible solutions, this implies that uh, this implies the result, right? This implies that Fiedler must output some S, maybe ST, maybe something even better, uh, but at least as good as ST, right? Such that the maximum of H of S and H of S bar is less than or equal to the square root of two times the Rayleigh quotient of F with L. Um, so any questions on the, on the reduction here, assuming the proof of the lemma? Could you say one more time why the support being less than or equal to V over two implies the same thing for the size? Yeah, so, so S, of, S of T, so remember that S of T is defined to be uh, V such that F of V is greater, greater than or equal to T. So if we pick, if we take T strictly greater than zero, right? This only includes, this can only possibly include uh, kind of elements V such that F of V is greater than zero, right? But what does the support being at most V over two mean? It means there are only V over two elements that possibly satisfy this, right? So there can, we can only possibly take uh, at most V over two because of the size of the support. So it's just, it's just kind of by definition with the, with how ST is, is defined. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Good question. Um, okay. So if there, if there are no more on, on how that lemma is sufficient to prove the result, uh, let's go ahead and actually prove the lemma. Uh, Okay, so uh, let me let me maybe give what kind of the key ideas here are first. So there are kind of two ideas. The first is that we'll see that basically uh, we're allowed to kind of shift f by a constant, however we want, and I'll, I'll say why in a second. But we're going to basically use this to balance the input function f. We're going to make kind of half of it negative and half of it positive, positive. and then what we're going to do is we're going to separately consider the negative and positive parts. So separately consider kind of what I'll vaguely for now call F plus and F minus, which are basically the separated positive and negative portions. And because we've balanced things, they're both, uh, they're both the kind of support at most V over two. And the idea is to show that kind of either F plus or F minus has to have Rayleigh quotient uh, at least as small as F. Uh, and, and I'll basically show that this gives all of the properties that we want. Um, so this is vague, but, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll say what I mean exactly now. So to start, uh, so first, notice, uh, so, okay, remember that uh, F is, we're guaranteed that F is orthogonal to one. So notice that because of this, shifting F can only lower the Rayleigh quotient. Uh, so why is this? Well, let me just explicitly compute it. So let's say that we shift by, for any, for any C, we shift by C times the all ones vector. Uh, so what's the Rayleigh quotient of this with respect to L? Uh, well, this is equal to, I'm maybe gonna uh, skip a step here. So why, why is the numerator equal to F transpose LF? Well, this is because remember that this is the trick that we used earlier as well. Remember the all ones function is in the kernel of L. So it just kills kind of the addition that we've had here. And then on bottom, remember that F is orthogonal to, to all ones. So, uh, you know, taking, I guess maybe I'll write out this step, taking F of C1 transpose F plus C1 by orthogonality, right? This is equal to uh, F transpose F plus C squared N. But C squared is, uh, I mean, so this is positive or, or at least non-negative, right? So this is less than or equal to F transpose LF over F transpose F. And I suppose we won't care about this, but equality holds exactly when C equals zero, right? When you haven't actually shifted it at all. So any kind of non-trivial shift will lower the Rayleigh quotient. Uh, and this really just says we can kind of shift our vector however we, we want. Shifts don't really matter. And this will be useful for us so that we can do this step one, this key idea one, where we're gonna balance the function F, right? So let's consider kind of the balanced version of F, F prime which is equal to F minus the median 
uh, times the all ones function. So we're just subtracting off the median. Uh, and this is going to make sure that, that half of the values are negative, or at most half of the values are negative, and at most half of the values are positive. So uh, this implies that kind of at most v over 2, this is just by definition the median, at most v over 2 values uh, of f prime are negative. Similarly, at most v over 2 are positive. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is uh, just what I said. I'm going to split the function into kind of the positive part and the negative part, and I'm going to consider them separately. Right. So in particular, I'm going to write f prime is equal to f plus minus f minus, where let me let me define these. f plus is is just the positive part. So this is equal to f prime. So maybe f f plus of v is equal to f prime of v uh, as long as f prime of v is greater than or equal to zero. Uh, and, and it's equal to zero otherwise. Uh, and f minus v, this is equal to actually, we're going we're gonna to flip it, because uh, remember that we kind of, we want things to be non-negative. So this is going to be equal to negative f prime of v, uh, as long as f prime of v is less than or equal to zero, uh, and it will be zero otherwise. Uh, OK, so let's, let's quickly note some properties of, of f plus and f minus. So, okay, what were what were the four properties we were trying to prove? Uh, so we wanted we wanted kind of a function where g is non-negative. So f plus and f minus by definition are both non-negative, right? Uh, we wanted their support to be at most v over two. By definition, I said that this shifted f vector had at most v over two positive values and at most v over two negative values. So these are both uh, of size at most v over two. And so it remains to show these two properties, right? We have to show for f plus and f minus. Kind of that maybe one of the, oh sorry that one of them uh, one of them has smaller Rayleigh quotient than f uh, and that every cut considered on f plus and f minus by Fiedler is also considered on on f. Um, okay, so kind of we had. Oh, sorry, uh, I had a question. So yeah. uh, you're also considering like all the places where it's zero, right? Uh, in as positive, but then is it also true that v over two would be at most positive? Like median could be like, there could be similar values. Like if all the values are same, I mean, I'm assuming like you're not considering one. Right? If all the values are the same and you subtract the median, you get all zero, right? So this still has at most v over two positive or v over two negative. So you you, you don't care how many zeros there are. I mean, you just need to- Oh, I more, see. I see you're only looking at the like unique values now. Okay. You're only looking at unique f of v's or? No, I mean, it, th there should only be v over two values greater than zero, and the rest should be. So it, when we when we when we split into f plus and f minus, okay. So so f prime by subtracting the median, right? We've we'd made sure that this gives a function, which maybe it has zeros, which you don't care about. Oh, right? you're not caring about zeros. So you're only counting the positive. Right, we're, we're only counting right. We're only counting kind of non-zero things. We want to make sure there are most v over two non-zero things. Okay. Okay. So there, yeah, there could be a bunch of zero things, but kind of you don't have to care about them because we what we care about in the end is that the support, because uh, we're kind of zero right for the positive function, we're zeroing out everything that's negative, and for the negative one, we're zeroing out everything that's positive. So all you care about is there's kind of less than less than or equal to v over two positive values and less than or equal to v over two negative values. You don't care how many zeros there are; those okay. will still be zero. Okay. Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Does that makes sense. Uh, Poan, were you going to ask something? I thought I saw you unmute. Uh, I was, but um, I, I think I, I, I answered it for myself. OK, cool. Just wanted to make sure. Uh, OK, so we, we need to show two things I said. So first, let's kind of show the easier one. Let's show kind of all, all cuts considered by Fiedler on f plus and f minus are also considered on f. Let's start with this. Uh, OK, so what is the form of the cuts considered by Fiedler on, let's say, f plus? Uh, so this, we can always write this as v, such that f of v is greater than or equal to some t. Right? This isn't necessarily a, exactly the form uh, that we gave in the algorithm. But for, for some t, you know, this does give the form of every cut considered by Fiedler. 
And notice that because basically all we've done is shift by the median, this is exactly equivalent to the set uh, f of v. Sorry, uh, this should be f plus of v. Sorry, this is exactly equivalent to the set f of v is greater than or equal to uh, m plus t, which is also also a set considered by Fiedler on, on f. So in f plus, we're good. And, and, the, and now the argument for f minus is analogous. Right? So we can always express it in this form. And because all we're doing is kind of subtracting off the, the median, uh, and in this case, we're negating. So it's going to be a little bit different. It's actually going to be the complement of this, but that's, that's fine. It doesn't matter whether you consider the, the complement uh, or, the, or the original set. Um, this is just going to be f of v such that uh, it's greater than or equal to m minus t, where the form is just because we've flipped uh, in, in we've remember f minus v is, is negative of the negative values. So you end up getting kind of this flipped version below. Uh, but, but in essence, I mean, you can go through and verify, your, verify this for yourself if you want to, uh, basically because all we've done is shift by the median and then taken the positive and negative values. Uh, the, the cuts considered on f plus and f minus are exactly just shifts of cuts considered on the original function f. Um, so this gives us the fourth property. I did this first just because it's a little bit easier. Uh, and finally, we need to prove, so the last thing we need to prove, we want to show that the minimum of the Rayleigh quotient of f plus uh, l and the Rayleigh quotient of f minus l we want to show that this is less than or equal to the Rayleigh quotient of uh, f, but we'll do this through f prime because remember at the beginning we said that f prime is just a shift, uh, and so has Rayleigh quotient less than than R L of f. So in particular, we're going to prove this part of it, which is sufficient, um, and we're going to do this just by expanding out the right hand term and kind of manipulating things until we get uh, until we get what we want. Um, okay, so the Rayleigh quotient of f prime l, let's just write this out. Um, so this is equal to the sum over edges of uh, maybe f of v minus f of w squared. So maybe I should say this is vw just the first time. Uh, divided by, these should be f primes, divided by f prime transpose uh, f prime. So this is basically just from definition, right? Uh, and now the idea is let's write out f prime in terms of f plus and f minus, right? So f prime is equal to f plus minus f minus. So we can write this out uh, as a, a somewhat disgusting sum on the numerator, unfortunately. So this is uh, f, f prime of v, sorry, f plus of v minus f plus of w minus f minus of v minus f minus of w. And the whole thing is squared. Uh, and then Note that f plus and f minus are orthogonal, right? Because uh, f, anywhere that f plus has a value, f minus has been zeroed out by definition. And anywhere that f minus has a positive value, f plus has been zeroed out by definition. So these are orthogonal. So the, the denominator, this is just to say that the denominator can be written out. We can just separate these two terms, right? This is just the inner product of f plus and f minus separately. OK. So our goal is to kind of massage this uh, into the term of the Rayleigh quotients of f plus and f minus. And if you look at this numerator, we're kind of almost there, uh, right? The, the, basically, if we, if we extend out this, if we expand out this square, the only problem is kind of the cross term. So we're going to take a look at the cross term. Uh, in particular, we're going to prove that uh, this, this kind of ugly term minus uh, f minus v minus f minus w, the whole thing is squared. We're going to prove that this is greater than or equal to f plus v uh, minus f plus w squared plus uh, f minus v minus f minus w squared. And the idea here thing is that right, this is uh, these these terms are what appear in the Laplacian of f plus and f minus, right? So we're just trying to massage things into the form of Laplacian of f plus and f minus to end up comparing to this, this term here. Um, okay, so why, why is this bound true? Well, okay, first assume, we're just gonna kind of break this into two cases. 
based on the signs of uh, Fu and Fv. So first assume that the sign of Fu is equal to the sign of Fv. I claim that in this case, things are obvious, that this, this inequality is obvious. Uh, and in fact, it's an equality. Why is that? Well, if they're both negative, these F plus terms by definition are zero, right? And if they're both uh, positive, the F minus terms are both zero. So all you get is kind of one of these terms squared, which is exactly what you'll get on the right-hand side as well. So in other words, the cross term is zero if, if this happens. Uh, and this isn't hard to see. OK, so then uh, you know, what if we assume uh, that this is not equal? Well, let's take a look at the cross term. It's uh, negative 2 f plus v minus f plus w times f minus v minus f minus w. And I claim that you can either kind of by going through the casework or just by looking at this, if the signs differ, this has to be greater than or equal to 0. Uh, in, in particular, basically, these two terms have to be different sign, which cancels with the negative at the front and, and forces it to be greater than 0. Uh, if you don't believe me, just go through the, go through the two cases uh, uh, by yourself after, after lecture. It's, it's not that hard to see, um, at least if you write it out. Uh, OK, so what, what does this say? Well, this allows us to lower bound the Rayleigh quotient of f prime by uh, the kind of sums that are starting to look more like the Rayleigh quotients of f plus and f minus. Um, let me just write this out. This is all divided by the f plus transpose f plus f minus transpose f minus. Uh, and, and now this is starting to look like the Laplacian, right? And in particular, we can actually kind of replace some of these terms with, uh, with the Laplacians. So let's see what we get. Uh, well, we can, we can write this as, uh, so basically we're going to kind of isolate this term. And, and this is the quadratic form given by the Laplacian, except for that we've kind of forgotten to normalize by f plus transpose f, right? So in particular, we can write this out as the Rayleigh quotient of f plus l times f plus transpose f plus plus the Rayleigh quotient of f minus l, just symmetrically, f minus transpose f minus divided by f plus transpose f. So the D has been eaten into the Rayleigh quotient, so it doesn't appear in the denominator anymore, plus uh, F minus transpose F minus. Uh, and then if you just replace, uh, you know, this is, this is upper bounded by, if we just replace both of these terms by the minimum of the two, right? So if we just replace this by minimum uh, Rayleigh quotient of F plus L, Rayleigh quotient of F minus L, uh, and then, and then, kind of just grouping things together, right? For one of these terms, we get f plus transpose f plus. For the other term, we get f minus transpose f minus. But this is exactly what we were dividing by, right? This this cancels the denominator. But then this this gets us exactly what we wanted. In other words, that the minimum of the Rayleigh quotients of f plus and f minus uh, has to be less than or equal to the Rayleigh quotient of f prime, which is because it's a shift of f, less than or equal to the Rayleigh quotient of f. So finally, this implies kind of either f plus or f minus has smaller uh, or at least not larger Rayleigh quotient as the original function f. And that was the final property we were trying to prove of the lemma. And we already saw how the lemma implies the result. So this is the full proof of uh, the upper bound of Cheeger, or even the stronger constructive version. Um, oh, I just Can you guys still see my screen? OK, sorry, I had more screen issues. Uh, OK, that's, that's, uh, that's the whole proof. So I guess we'll pause for questions before moving over to Shahar. Anybody have any questions? I mean, this is definitely technical proof. So I mean, it's probably best if you know if you go through the notes and you, you work out the details. I mean, it's probably you know hard to internalize everything. You know, just listening to it. But when I mean, I think it's important to say it. I mean, we decided to include it because it's, it's a very you know fundamental theorem, and it, also it's it's a good demonstration of how we go back and forth between 
studying questions about graphs and edges and how we use the linear algebra, you know, and adjacent symmetries to bridge them. It's very powerful technique. Yeah, it's very it's very technical. I think I think everything I did this time should be kind of as written in the notes. So hopefully, if you go read the notes, everything will look familiar, and it should be easier to kind of see the technical portions of the of the proof. So I guess we have a little less time than expected for the for the random walk part. Sorry, Shahar. But no, we'll time's perfect. Go ahead and shift over to that. On, on Thursday. It's perfect. So let me now share my screen. Okay, so what we're going to start talking about today is a new topic. This is a finished chapter one in the notes. So, okay. And so, you know, in the notes we marked it this week one and took a bit longer, but you know, it's all like, you know, approximation, you know, how much time it's going to take us to teach the material. Uh, the second topic that we're going to talk about is uh, random walks on expanders. Uh, sorry. So, wait, what's going on here? Sorry, my iPad is acting up. We have not had good share screen luck today, apparently. No, just not. Uh, no, what's going on here? Uh, I'll stop. Okay. Okay, let me just try to do it. I see it's I'm not sure what's going on here. So is it showing or not? It's not clear to me if it's showing or not. Okay, random. Yeah. Whoops. We I think we we can see. On expanders. Good. So what's the idea of random box on expanders? So you know we have a graph. So maybe you know this is my graph. And we have a bunch of edges here. And here I'm doing some, I don't know, Peterson graph, whatever. So what is the idea of using a random walk? The idea that you start somewhere. So you start at some point, let's say here, at, at, a, at a graph. And then you start taking steps on the graph following edges. So maybe, you know, you start here and then, you know, you maybe you go here. So you get to this node, and then you choose to maybe go here, and you get to this node, then you go here, and you get to this node, and so on. And that's sort of some way of generating, you know, the sequence of vertices in the graph. And you should think of these vertices representing sort of objects we're trying to, to sample from. Like maybe, you know, we are trying to sample, you know, independent sets in a, in a graph. And then every node corresponds to an independent set. Or maybe we're trying to generate random bits for like in a randomized algorithm. And then every node corresponds to a set of random of bits. It could be fed as this random sequence or, or whatever process you're trying to simulate. And, um, and so think of these this edges as representatives of local changes or something, some simple changes. And the um, the idea of using expanders is that they, they mix fast. So what does it mean? Even if I start at a node that is, sort of, let's say, arbitrary, and I take a short random walk in an expander, we're going to prove that very fast we converge to a distribution that is very close to uniform over the, the nodes. And that's going to be a very efficient way to generate samples that are very close to, to random but without spending too many random bits in this process. And, and then we're going to see an application of that to sort of how do we reduce error in randomized algorithms by only spending a few more bits, random bits. So that can be the application we're going to see. But, but really, I want to, to emphasize that this, this, this is part of a much more general area that is called um, 
Markov chain, Monte Carlo, or oh, I believe it's called MCMC. Algorithms, which are in this family of algorithms that try to generate something. Like, I don't know, maybe I want to find a, a random tree in a graph or a random object of some family. And you start by finding just one of them. And then you keep making small changes. And what you want to prove is this type of local changes mix fast to get to a random object or a new random object in whatever family of objects you're trying to see. And there's a huge, huge, huge literature on this, you know, both in theoretical CS, there's also literature in statistical physics, because it turns out a lot of physical phenomena can be modeled in this way where nature makes local changes, small changes and converges to some minimal energy or something close to that. So we're not gonna cover all of it or in part of it, but we're gonna see some glimpse into why random walks mix fast and in particular why if your underlying graph that models your um, dynamical system is an expander, why this makes it mix fast. Okay, so we're gonna start today. We, we don't have much time, maybe another 15 minutes. So I'll, I'll try today to stay maybe more a bit of high level. And then next lecture, we're gonna see a bit more detail about it. Okay, so. Let's continue. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's begin. So first, I want to model the things. So we have a graph. So we're going to have like a D regular graph. And you know, to model this type of a random walk, it makes it's very convenient to look at then what's called a normalizer. Adjacency matrix of this graph. So we, we denoted it in the node by AG. So I'm going to keep this notation. So it's a matrix whose VW entry is a following. So if VW is an edge in my graph, I'm going to put a one over D. And if not, if VW is not an edge, I'm going to put zero. So it's again, this is the same metric that we looked when we considered, you know, the eigenvalues of the of the graph and we defined expander and we, we talked about spectral expansion. So it's exactly the same metrics, but now we're going to use it to study random walks on expander. So the first thing I want to show you is why is it so useful to consider these metrics when we try to analyze random walks? So here, let's start with the definition. What is a, what is a path? So, let me start with the definition. Um, so a length t random walk on G is a sequence of vertices. V0 to Vt. So by definition, we're going to make T steps. And so we're going to have T plus one nodes. We have a start node and, and then we take T steps where, so V0 is sampled from some, let's call it pi, some initial distribution. So the first node we sample from some initial distribution that might depend on the application we have in mind. So we make no guarantees on that. But once we sample the first node, so OI going from one to T, so we're gonna sample VI is going to be a random neighbor. of VA minus one in the graph, okay? So once we selected V0, V0 is gonna be, V1 is gonna be a random neighbor of V0 and V2 is gonna be a random neighbor of V1 and so on. Okay, so this is a process that we're going to try and analyze. So first let's see, are there any questions about this process? So again, we select the first node by some arbitrary distribution and then we keep making a random step. So a time from a node to a random neighbor. Notice by the way, we're allowed to return to the same node the second time. Whenever 
it's sort of like a memoryless process, right? So it, it's okay to go on an edge and then go back. I mean, we're not requiring not to do that. Everything is allowed. In terms of this base definition, is there any restriction on um, like the kind of ran randomness? Like, are we assuming a uniform yes. kind of probability of going to each? Yeah, I'll assume it's uniform. I mean, you can encode non-uniform by basically changing the suggestion symmetrics or making the graph be a weighted graph, but for us, it would be enough to consider a uniform random neighbor. So when I say random and I don't specify, I would always think uniform random in whatever set I'm talking about. Thank you. Yeah. So I want to show that we can model this process by, by using this matrix AG. So, what, so here's like a, a nice claim. So first of all, there's a piece of notation So I'm gonna, so if pi is some distribution on V, there are two ways we can view it. We can view it as an element in a vector of length V, which you know, real values, I mean, a negative value then sums to one. That's one way to view it. Or we could view it basically as a function from V the negative values. And I mean, the equivalent definitions, but having these two viewpoints is useful because in some contexts, it's better to get path a vector. And in some other contexts, it's better to get a function. And, you know, we're going to use them interchangeably. So I mean, so for example, you know, I can think of pi at coordinate v, and that's going to be exactly pi applied to the value of v. So I'm going to use both of these notations. Either view in pi as a function or as, you know, a vector. So this is just a piece of notation. So let me first see if there are any questions about this notation before we you know, move forward. Okay. So, so I want to make the following claim. So assume we choose V0 coming from some initial distribution. And then we sample, you know, V1 to through VT by taking, by doing a random walk. By taking a random walk. Now let's say that, let's call this pi T, be the distribution. Vt. So pi t is the marginal distribution of the t steps in the work. Okay. And the claim said that there's a simple formula connecting the initial distribution and pi t. Then pi t, you can get, but take, you take the adjacency matrix and normalize one, raise it to the tth power, and multiply by the initial one. So that's a claim. So basically, if I have a distribution over the nodes and I want to take T steps and ask what the final distribution, it would exactly correspond to just multiplying by the T power of this normalized adjacency matrix. So this is why the normalized adjacency matrix is so useful when we study, you know, random work. It just translates everything into linear algebra. Okay. And the proof is basically just sort of going through the definitions. So the proof is going to be basically, let's do it by induction on T. So the base case of T equals zero is obvious, right? Because if T is zero, A G to the power of zero is identity, I get pi in it, which is what I started from, that's obvious. So let's do the general case. So by induction, we know that pi, the distribution of the T minus one steps is A G T minus one by init, right? This is just an induction hypothesis. And now what is pi T? So by definition, what is pi T of V? The, the probability that they get to some node V after P steps, where it's exactly going to be equal to one over D summing over all 
the neighbors of V in the graph, phi t minus one, W. So again, what is the distribution of reaching a node V after these steps? Well, to reach to a node V, I need to reach one of its neighbors in the previous step, step T minus one. And given that I reached it, then with probability one over D, I'm gonna reach V. Okay, so this is like the crucial identity here. So let me just, let's take like, you know, 10 seconds and stir it and see if you have any questions, why is this true? Because once you agree with it, everything is just plugging in the definitions. So again, the, 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 the justification is if I want to reach a node V at step T, I should definitely reach its neighbor, some neighbor of it, step T minus one, so I can sum over its neighbors and given a specific neighbor W, the probability I'm gonna reach from it to T is exactly the degree of this node W, which is D. So here we're using the fact that this is a D regular graph. So it sort of simplifies the various calculations here. Okay, and what is this? I'm claiming this is exactly AG phi T minus one at the V coordinates. Why? Because what is AG? Remember AG was exactly the matrix corresponding to take to consider all the possible neighbors or the edges and, and scaling each one by one over D. Okay, so we have to go back to this definition here. So this was AG. So we just scale every edge by one over D, which is exactly what we get here in this calculation, right? So, so that's it, that's the whole proof, because now we can just plug it in, right? So now, so once we know that, then we know that pi T is AG phi t minus one, which is by induction AG, AG to the t minus one phi in it, which is AG to the t phi in it. So it's a very short proof. So this proof really sort of just verifies that, you know, we define the matrix AG in the correct way to model this random box. So any questions so far? Okay, cool. So now we're gonna use the fact that we can use it in our algebra, that's gonna be very useful for us. So the next thing that we want to look at is, well, what is a distribution that stays the same after taking a random walk? So by definition, we say that pi s is a stationary distribution If you know AG by S is by S. Okay, so if I have this distribution of nodes and I take one step in my random walk, I get the same distribution. And so here's a claim. I think we do not prove in the nodes. So if G is connect, if G is let's say D regular. and connected, then the only stationary distribution is the uniform distribution. Okay. So first, well, let's, let's understand what this means. It says, well, so my graph is deregular. So first I'm saying, well, if I take the uniform distribution of the nodes and I take a random walk one step, I'm gonna still stay with a uniform distribution. And moreover, that's the only such distribution assuming the graph is connected. Okay, so, so let's first understand intuitively why this is true and why do we need this connected uh, condition. So first note that if the graph is not connected, then this is false. I mean, if my graph is not connected, if my graph, let's say, has two connected components, then I can take, if I, if I take the uniform distribution of one of them, it's gonna be stationary or the other one or any mix of the two. And this just corresponds to the fact that this graph has multiple eigenvectors, eigenvalue one. But if the graph is connected, and this cannot happen, and this 
exactly corresponds to the, to the fact that if I have the adjacency matrix of the connected graph, then it has exactly one eigenvector with eigenvalue one, not more than one. So I'm not going to prove this claim, so it's, it's a nice, I think, exercise in linear algebra, but I mean, I don't want to sort of spend time proving it. I mean, I don't think we included this in the homework, but I think it's still a good exercise for you to try and prove it yourself. And if there are any questions, then when I can improve it next time, or we can discuss on Piazza. I mean, I think it should be a nice exercise for people to try and prove it. So really, you should think about the station distribution as a distribution that we're gonna try and aim for. So we're gonna start with some arbitrary distribution over the nodes. And we're gonna ask, well, how fast, if we take a random walk, we're going to converge to this stationary distribution. Now, if you try to actually get to uniform and just taking random walks is not good enough. I mean, it's sort of, you can't quite erase all the history and you will not be exactly stationary or exactly uniform in our case, but you get very, very close to it. So the next question is, how do we even measure distances of distributions, right? What does it mean that one distribution is close to another distribution? And there are various ways you can define it, but it turns out the, the, the most convenient one for most applications it's something called the total variation distance. So let me make another definition here. So here's the definition. So let, let's say pi one and pi two with two distributions. So there total variation distance which is called TV distance is basically the, the largest event that can separate the two things is the following thing. So the total variation distance between these two distributions, pi one and pi two, is you maximize over all possible events B asking what's the probability that B happens under pi one minus it B happens under pi two, okay? So if you think about these two distributions as generating between sort of two different sort of processes or whatever, so you're asking what is the event that is the most likely under pi one and the least likely under pi two or the other way around, okay? So this is like a very, very useful notion of distance because it sort of says, you know, if two distributions are, are very similar, very close in total variation distance, then we can't really separate them. But for any question that we might care about pi one, in some event, we will have roughly the same probability under pi two, vice versa. Right? So it's, it's a very, it's a very useful definition. And, and there's actually a simple claim saying that, well, when we view distributions as vectors, actually there's a very simple definition for that. So this is gonna be, I think, exactly half. Pi one minus pi two, the L1 distance. So just to, to write this more formally, it's half the sum of all possible V, pi one V minus pi two V, okay. So again, so this total variation, I mean, the way I define it initially is by this of uh, operative definition. It says, well, what's the event that is, where well, its probability in pi one and pi two is, is the, the largest gap. But actually there's a very simple analytical definition just up to factor of two, the L1 distance between pi one and pi two. So we're gonna use L1 to capture things, but just this factor of a half doesn't really make a big difference anyways. So, so here's be the, the main lemma that we're going to prove next time. So I'm just gonna state it now, and then we're gonna prove it next time. And so I'm gonna state this lemma, then this is what I'm gonna finish today. And this lemma is gonna say that if I start with any distribution um, over the nodes of, a, of an expander, and I take a few steps, I'm gonna mix very fast um, and get to, to something very close to to the, to the stationary distribution. So, so let G 
be a lambda expander. So for any P by any distribution, let V0 up to Vt be a T-step random walk. And let phi t be the, be the distribution of the final node. Okay, so t is some parameter I haven't defined yet. Then for t equal, well, some value we're going to specify in a second. Okay, we're going to get, let's say, L1 distance between pi t and the stationary distribution of the Jesuit uniform. And the uniform distribution is at most epsilon. Okay, so t is going to be some function of epsilon and lambda and the number of nodes. And turn out that the, the right function that you're going to get here is going to be something of the following form log root n over epsilon over log one over lambda. So this is, the, let's just, I just want to go through this lemma one more time, and then we're gonna stop for today. And we're gonna prove this lemma and see some applications next time. So the lemma says, take G to be a lambda expander and take any initial distribution. And let's say, and also any, so for any, Epsilon positive. If I choose T to be this quantity, which is again log roughly logarithmic in n over epsilon, normalized by log one over lambda. So if you think of lambda as a constant, this is basically logarithmic in n over epsilon. So it's so it's sort of if, if so it's very close to the diameter of the graph. If you think of epsilon as being so let's say also, also a constant, the order of log n. If you make order of log n steps, you're very close to uniform. So if you remember last time we saw that an expander, maybe it's in your homework, that the diameter of an expander is order log n. So every two nodes, the, the shortest path between them is length order log n, if lambda is a constant. And this lemma says something much stronger. It says, well, not only is it the diameter is order of log n, but if you make slightly more, but still order of log n steps, you're going to be very close to uniform. Okay, so this is, a very powerful statement about expanders. Making order of log n steps on an expander from any initial distribution leads to a distribution that is very, very close to uniform. Okay. So yeah, so this is, we're gonna to finish today. So now let's see if people have any questions and if not, everyone finish. So then the, next, the plan for the next lecture is, uh, I'll first review some of the definitions, then we're gonna prove this lemma, and then we're gonna see some nice applications of it. So how do we make randomized algorithms be, have much smaller error in some generic way that is only very few randomness. Okay. So I guess okay, that's it for today, and we'll see you all on Thursday. Okay. Bye everybody. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so by by saying that pi s is a distribution, do you mean like pi s is a random variable? Because I'm just not familiar with this. Oh, so, I see. No, by distribution, I mean, I just specify the probability for every possible vertex, right? So I'm saying if my graph has like 10 vertices, so the first vertex is probability 0 0.1, and the second one 0 0.3, and the third one 0, and so on. So it's a vector of length 10 of non-negative mm -hmm. number that sums to one. So that's it, this is what I mean. So, oh, so it's a vector and each entry is the probability of. Yes, um, yes, yes, yes. So by distribution, I just mean it's a vector of values of probabilities. But uh, why do they sum to one? And they sum to one because probabilities you sum to one, right? 
Uh, what, what is each entry again, sir? Okay, let me just, let me just show the screen again so I can write it. So it should be here. So what is a distribution? So I have a distribution, distribution over my nodes V, right? Yes. So then it's just a vector pi in R, no negative zero V. So it's just a, so you can use the vector pi V1, pi V2, up to pi Vn. It has, let's say we have n nodes, there's n numbers, where they're all non-negative, and also they sum to one. All right, so this is the definition of a distribution. So what does pi v1 mean, for example? Pi v1 is, if I sample, if, imagine I can I sample a vertex from this probability. So pi v1 is a probability that this vertex is v1. Oh, okay. So it's the probability that this vertex is v1. Yes. Okay. Yeah. No, so, so you should not think of it as a random variable. I mean, you could do that. But but for now maybe it's better if you don't do that. Later it might be useful to talk about random variables. But for now, yeah, yeah, because solution, yeah. Because yeah, because the total variation stuff you're mentioning is used, uh, is applied on random variable in my in my probability class. So yeah. Yeah, okay, it, could, it, it could it could apply to yeah, it, it can be applied to both probabilities or random variables. Um, they're basically describing the same phenomena from two different viewpoints, right? Yeah. Okay, a distribution tells you what's a probability every element is sampled and a random variable is this specific element of the sample. But they're just two equivalent viewpoints. Okay. So when, are, when you are saying pi s, s is just a graph um, or a word, set of words. Yeah, pi, so like for specifically here. Yeah. So pi s is just one over n one over n, one over n, just the uniform distribution. Oh, okay. Just this and that's thing. because the you define as to have that uniform distribution. I think I'm just defining pi s to be the stationary distribution of the random walk on the graph. And I said, if the graph is connected, that's the only one. That's, a, that's the only stationary distribution that exists. So this was a claim that I stated, but didn't prove. Okay. Yeah, okay, thanks. So, so, for, so in order for the uh, expander uh, to be useful, you also need it uh, to be explicit, right? Yes, yes. Is yes. that necessary or it's just, if it's not explicit, you can still do something? Usually you need to be explicit. I mean, if you want to use it for anything, you need to just be able to say, here's a node, what's like a random label of this node? Right, so you need some way of computing that. If you don't know how to compute it, then it's not very useful. Yes, yeah, so, you, so you generally you want your, your graphs to be explicit. So and we're gonna show some construction for that. We're gonna show, we're gonna show two different constructions in week five. Thanks. Okay, anything else? Oh, are we done? Okay, that's well done, okay.